So we're presented this morning, much like we did last week actually, with a story that appears in all four Gospels. And I think it's important to remember how rare this is. For example, the parable of the Good Samaritan, one Gospel. The parable of the prodigal son, only in one. The Beatitudes, blessed are the poor in spirit, blessed are those who weep, two. And even the Lord's Prayer that we have been reciting as Christians for millennia is only found in one of the Gospels. But this story is repeated in all of them. And again, that just highlights for us the importance of this story. So significant that all four gospel writers include it in some way. This tells us to pay attention. There's something here that we are supposed to see and hear and know. And in this story today, you know, it's interesting. Um, last year, when I preached on this story, I talked about the political situation and the way that this march into Jerusalem and all of the drama that was put around it, all the theater was intentional on the part of Jesus to poke fun at the Roman Empire. But today it's not Jesus actually that captures my attention. It's all of these followers. Because in today's story we see a seismic shift in who they are. Because up to this moment throughout the scriptures, the followers have been pretty passive. They follow Jesus around from town to town. They sit down. He teaches them. They receive loaves and fishes and get fed. They receive the healing. Pretty passive. But today something changes. Today they are no longer passive. They are the story to some extent. There's this forming of the parade and the shouting that just draws all this attention. And it is the first time that the followers shout to the world that they belong to God. That they belong to God in Jesus. Now, this is a moment where they absolutely and entirely and unequivocally announce their allegiance to Jesus as opposed to the state. They announce that they are, they renounce actually their allegiance to anything that is not Jesus, to all princes and principalities and governments. They announce out loud their commitment to follow this one person above all things. They vow with their faith that they will witness to the person of Jesus. Now it is this kind of energy and courage that we see in pockets throughout all of history. People who are emboldened by the gospel, people who have a relationship with Jesus that they cannot deny, do these kinds of things. This is the energy of civil disobedience. When we see the larger political structures doing something to our fellow brothers and sisters that we cannot tolerate. It is the same energy back in the 80s that used to have people climbing over fences at nuclear facilities and beating the, the um, heads, I don't know what those are called, but beating them with hammers and throwing paint on them to demonstrate this is fundamentally against the law of God and certainly the person of Jesus. It is the same energy behind Black Lives Matter. It is the same energy against protests about putting babies in cages at the border. But this energy comes from this relationship with God where we decide that we can no longer be passive, that we are not actually called to sit and take it in and be loved and then go home and forget about it, that we are like the followers of Jesus at some point all asked to find our courage and to find our voice. You 
you know, we believe in the Christian church, at least we talk all the time about how Pentecost is the birth of the church. Kind of wonder if it actually wasn't Palm Sunday. I kind of wonder about this day where this is where the followers finally grew up. Where they admitted that their relationship with Jesus was reciprocal and required a response. They found their voice and they found their courage. And I think the story challenges us to do the same. It challenges us to stop being passive in our relationship with God. It challenges us to get on our feet, to open our eyes and to open our hearts, to reach out our hands, to recognize that the world needs followers of Jesus or this mess will never get better. And it invites us to remember that every time we do that, let's not forget where Palm Sunday ends. Oh, there's resurrection. That's the good news. But there's also Good Friday. And that, my friends, is why so few of us do it. So few of us are able to actually take that message of Jesus and that relationship that we have with God and turn it outward and become active and raise our voices in protest in the places that need us to protest. Because pieces of us die every time we do that. And in some cases, if we are brave enough and loud enough, our physical safety gets called into question. Ask Martin Luther King about that. And yet this is what we are given on this beginning of the most holiest week in the church year that most of us, most Christians don't go anywhere near. We show up today and then we show up again on Easter just for the good news. Yet if we are to understand this invitation completely and fully, then we are invited to enter into all of this week. To come to worship on Holy, Holy Thursday to remember the Last Supper, the betrayal, and all of the bad things that happened to Jesus after that. Because that's our story too. And we're invited to come on Good Friday when most of us don't really want to hear the story of death and pain and suffering at the hands of the empire. And yet, Easter makes no sense without it. This whole week takes courage. And so let us begin just there. Let us begin just there. Because if we can find our courage in our voice, then we recognize that it's our turn now. Those followers are long gone. It's up to us. It's our turn to show the world who God really is. It's our turn to show the world what love looks like. It's our turn to show the world what it means to forgive. And not just seven times, but seven times, 70 times. It's our turn to show the world what it means to embrace the stranger. It's our turn. So maybe the church isn't, wasn't really born in wind and fire as much as it was born in courage and connection. And that is the invitation. That's all I invite you to think about. What it would mean for you to say yes to birthing this church now with that kind of courage and with that strong, committed voice and to make Palm Sunday happen not just here, but in here. Amen.